Shalom. Today, the 19th day of the month of Menachem Av of this year of redemption, 5,783, corresponding to the 6th of August of the year 2023. And today we continue with our series on the future temple, the coming temple as prophesied in Ezekiel in chapters 40 through 48, and as explained by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato in his Kabbalistic gem, Mishkanei Elyon, the Sanctuaries of the Supreme, translated into English as Secrets of the Future Temple. And uh, before we go on today, let us just remind ourselves of the form of the temple. What we are looking here uh, from above is the main temple courtyard. Uh, there are two courtyards. There is the outer courtyard, which is the large square, and within it is the main temple courtyard, bang in the center. This is a, a square within a square, and on the upper part of the diagram is the actual uh, sanctuary itself. However, the, the, the inner square is the inner courtyard, which is open to the sky. And bang, in the middle of this inner courtyard is the temple altar outside. There was inside the sanctuary, there was and will be another altar, the incense altar. But uh, the main service of the priests with the sacrifices is on the central altar outside in the inner courtyard. Just to uh, get our bearings, when we are looking now at this diagram from above with the east direction below and the west direction above, we are looking at the outer courtyard of the future temple which is situated on the temple mount. We shall be hearing more about the dimensions, but the largest square in the diagram, the outer courtyard, is situated upon the Temple Mount, which extends in all directions from the outer courtyard. And today, particularly, we'll be focusing on uh, the differentiation between two areas of the actual temple structure. In the upper part of the diagram, above the square of the inner courtyard, is the, the plan, the ground plan of the actual sanctuary, which divides into two parts. The two parts are the innermost, the Holy of Holies, and uh, one enters through to get to the Holy of Holies, which only the High Priest is able to do, you have to go through the, uh, the sanctuary itself. So with that introduction to these locations, let us return now to our text. We had uh, seen in the previous session that the Temple Mount, with its various areas, the entire mount and the inner, the, the outer courtyard on the Temple Mount and the inner courtyard within the outer courtyard, these all are roots of all of the creation. As we saw at the end of our uh, study last week, the entire world is actually receiving its sustenance from the Temple Mount and the land of Israel is the intermediary between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the world and the Temple itself is shining to all of these areas. Well now let us come to the next section of our text. Building the house by connecting the lights. When the last of the ten lights, these are the ten sfirot, when the last of the ten lights, the shrina or malchut, as I shall explain presently, was complete, with all its lights shining and everything fixed and functioning properly, there appeared at the end, the end of this downward progression of sfirot, a certain place that is most awesome, the Holy of Holies are the Heavenly Temple. This is the place of great desire, 
the place of love and peace. This place is hidden and secret. Only the king may come there. No one may enter except for him. Well, now, the language of Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lusato in the original Hebrew is extremely dense and uh, has meaning on multiple levels. And one of the most important things we need to understand in approaching this text is that the vision of the temple as prophesied by Ezekiel, which we call the heavenly temple, the heavenly Jerusalem, is a vision that at the end of days will actually be manifested and realized in a structure of stone in this physical world. And here in this section, what we are talking about is actually the interface between We're talking about the interface between the, the metaphysical world of the Sfirot and the world that we live in, the material world. And uh, this is an extremely difficult concept for us to grasp that the the source of the physical building, the temple, is not a physical building. It is a structure, a metaphysical structure, and uh, we're going to have to come to terms with the fact that what we shall be hearing in the continuation of this work is how mathematical interrelationships, mathematical interrelationships between different levels of the upper worlds become expressed in the mathematical interrelationships between the dimensions of the courtyard, the floor dimension, the length, the breadth, the height of the walls, the height of the gate, the thickness of the walls, all of these mathematical figures which are manifested in the physical world, in the temple, they are all actually reflections of, in the material world, of a higher metaphysical being that we can only begin to grasp, because of the way our human minds work, we can only begin to grasp through visualizing the interrelationships between the numbers as they play out in the actual physical building. So in the text that we just began to look at, uh, we saw that he speaks about the last of the ten lights. Now here we have an allusion to the ten sfirot of the Kabbalah, which are the attributes of the Creator through which he brings the creation into being. And the upper nine sefirot are all sending a flow of influence from above down below. These are the divine powers that are nurturing and bringing into being our world. And the tenth sefira, which here is called the Shekhinah, the indwelling presence of God in our material world, because God himself is infinite, completely beyond all conception, all material form. Uh, but the tenth element, the element of Malchut, at the end of this downward progression, called the Shekhinah, is going to actually be the blueprint of the creation. The Shekhinah, in Kabbalistic terms, is also called the Malchut. Now the word Malchut comes from the Hebrew word Melech. Now in our modern world, kings are looked at as antiquated beings, but the concept of Melech is one of rulership. The Melech is the ruler, whether a physical sovereign or the Melech of the world. The Melech of the world, the king of the world, is sending creative energy from his exalted place all the way down into the material world as the light comes down stage by stage. And the tenth element, the tenth factor, the Malchut, is the attribute through which God's kingship actually becomes revealed in our world, becomes manifested in our world. The temple itself is a symbol of God's kingship. 
because all the various different parts of the temple which are bringing blessing into all the different parts of creation all of these different parts are expressions of the way God is ruling the world in order to bring the world to its ultimate perfection so to go a, a further in our text when the everything was ready for the revelation of the creation the last of the ten lights was complete all of its subsidiary lights which are what the Malchut is shining down having received from higher levels everything is fixed and functioning ready for the creation he writes here there appeared at the end a certain place that is most awesome the holy of holies of the heavenly temple we're now to say there appeared at the end of a certain place this location called the holy of holies uh, we are talking about how in the vision of Ezekiel he is revealing to us what is actually the center point of the temple, the point from which everything else emanates. And we are going to contrast this presently with the greater part of the sanctuary, the main sanctuary where the candelabrum and the incense altar and the showbread table were. But the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And here, Rabbi Moshe Lutzato evokes this as this place of great desire, the place of love and peace. That is to say that all of the creations are yearning to rise to somehow apprehend this place, but it is hidden and secret and only the king may come there. No one may enter except for him. That is to say that this area of the temple is completely, completely transcendent, above and beyond, and it needs no service except the one time in the year when the high priest enters on the Day of Atonement. This place contains all the beauty of this light, this shining malchut, all its radiance and perfection. <clears throat> in it are found all pleasantness and delight. And when the king enters, that is to say when the divine presence rests upon the temple, who could possibly express this? Who could describe the beauty, the goodness, the incomparable glory and holiness? And now, it was from this place that the other place of which I was speaking previously, which we looked at in our previous session, namely the rest of the heavenly temple, all emanated from this Holy of Holies and the foundation stone which we discussed last time, the Evan Shetiah, has its proper place within the Holy of Holies. So now he's going to sum up, understand this hidden and concealed place. That is to say the Holy of Holies contains all the beauty of the light of the tenth sphera of Malchut. The second place which is the sanctuary, the larger sanctuary, here contains all of the sources and roots of all created beings. So the first place is the Holy of Holies with the Ark and the Testimony, that is to say the two tablets of stone are situated where the foundation stone stands in all its power. And the second place is the rest of the temple structure which emerged, which developed out of the stone as will be explained later. See now, when the light called Malchut, the tenth sphera, as the downward flow of influence descended to the temple. So when this tenth sphera joined up with the king, with Melech, which is an allusion to the sphera of Tiferet, the center of all of the ten, here is a, a joining and an inconnection which results in the state of blissful tranquility and it is this interconnection that brings rise to the entire house in all its details, with all its various courtyards and chambers, interior and exterior. All of the different dimensions of the temple correspond to the related lights, whether few or many. So let us just uh, reflect on this for a moment. What we are saying is that 
the actual temple came into being through an interconnection between two levels, the level of the 10th sphira, that of Malchut, which somehow interacted with a higher level, which is called the level of Melech, as I said, Tiferet, or in terms of the Partsufim, Ze'er Ampid, the small face. In other words, when the Melech interacts with his attribute of Malchut, it's like when you make a, uh, a, 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 a graph with coordinates and you have uh, two coordinates interacting, so the two of them are going to, uh, to produce the tra- trajectory of the graph. There are two different levels interacting. So this is going to be explained in detail as we proceed in our text in terms of the way that the lights with their different mathematical properties because they're all divine images which in Torah terms are defined by mathematical uh, uh, quantities I begin when these interact it is these that bring about the dimensions of the house as will be explained so now just to go f- a little further in our text again so as we've just said, it's through the interaction between the Melech and his aspect of Malchut, through which he desires to reveal himself, through the interaction of these two levels, the higher and the lower, that the temple comes into being. And in this house are these great highways, which we spoke about earlier. These are the channels of influence, the divine influence, which is spreading forth to all the world. These highways stretch out to all the different orders and species of created beings. And these highways have glorious names. These are holy names, uh, uh, which uh, are of interconnections of Hebrew letters, uh, which give them their power and strength. And from these highways, all of the subsidiary pathways of influence that go out to all of the world are branching out. Everything has its own special name, everything arranged with the greatest wisdom, and it's from here that all things in creation are receiving their power. It's to these names that the various levels of creation attach themselves when they attend from the lower realm to the upper. When they reach these highways, they take cover under the great names I mentioned, so that nothing can be seen of the individual pathways. It's only when they emerge, each one in its own place, that they take on their own particular names. For this reason, in the house itself, only the highways have names, but not the pathways. Well, this is quite difficult concept for us, quite abstract, but the, uh, the general idea is that out of the house are emerging pathways of divine energy, which are bringing all the levels of creation into being. And there are the more general sources of these these influences. And then there are the more specific pathways of energy spreading out to all of the individual levels of creation, all the individual creations. Since the house emerges with such blissful tranquility, the house itself is called Menucha. We are familiar with the word Menucha from the services of the Shabbat, which we call a Yom Menucha. Menucha does not simply mean rest and relaxation in the contemporary sense, because the concept of Menucha is one of the greatest tranquility out of which comes prophecy. The word Menucha is also a term that has the connotation of divine inspiration and prophecy which is coming out of this house. To be in the house is to receive an influence of prophetic inspiration and blessing as we find in the case of the prophet Jonah, Yonah, who began his prophecy at the, who was first reached prophecy at the time of the Simchat Bet Eva, the ceremony of the, the joy of the drawing of the waters for the water libation on Sukkot. It was in the great joy of the singing and dancing of this all-night uh, uh, 
a ceremony of bringing up the water to the temple that the prophet Jonah received his prophecy. Now, continues Rabbi Moshe Chan Lutzata, once this house was built, we are talking here about the construction of the supreme heavenly temple, out of which the earthly temple emerges. Once this supreme heavenly temple was built, it was never again concealed. This holy house was created before the universe, for it's from this house that all created beings receive their power and sustenance. When the flow of blessing and sustenance reaches the house from the king, all its courtyards and chambers are seen to be full of power and strength to give to all who draw near, each according to his level. And for this reason, the flow of blessing and sustenance to this house has never ceased. If it were to be interrupted even for a moment, all created beings would immediately cease to exist. The king never turns his eyes away from his palace. If you were to object that it was only of the upper levels, the Parsufim of Abba and Ima, Chochma and Bina, of which the Kabbalah says that they never separate, but not of the lower levels, that Zer Anpin and the Nukva, namely Tif Eret and Malchut, do separate, that's not a valid objection. You've not yet plumbed the depths of wisdom and you've not yet found its roots. So just to give a little commentary on what uh, we've just heard, we speak about the first temple of King Solomon destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt by the Judeans who returned from exile in Babylon, the second temple destroyed by the Romans, and we are looking forward to the third temple. But here in the section we just studied, Rabbi Moshe Hamad is talking still about the heavenly temple, this metaphysical, spiritual creation, which is the source of all of the temples. In our coming session, we'll be looking at the differences between King Solomon's temple, the first temple, the second temple, and the coming third temple, and what these differences signify Kabbalistically. But for the moment, the point we just heard was that this supreme temple was actually built before the creation. As I've mentioned, the very opening word of the Hebrew text of the Torah alludes already to the temple in the six letters of the word Breshit, which may be arranged to spell out Bait Rosh, the house that is the head of creation. In other words, what changed between the first and second temples and the coming third temple is not the heavenly source, but the degree of revelation in our world, which reached its first summit of perfection in the time of King Solomon with the building of the first temple. But that could not remain in the world because the world was not yet sufficiently rectified. Israel sinned and the temple had to be taken away with all of the ensuing exile and suffering until we would be sufficiently purified to have the second temple and then all the more so with this seemingly endless exile until we finally purified to receive the third temple. But the heavenly temple is one and the same. No change there. So now to go into the next section of our text. Ramchal is going to speak about two different uh, concepts in terms of understanding how out of these metaphysical formulae, the divine names of the Paltsufim, the aspects of God that are shining down from the nine upper levels, the nine upper spherot, how they actually bring about this structure, whether it's the supernal temple, which is the Malchut of the upper worlds, or the physical temple that will, will be built around that structure. Turning now again to our text then, you must understand that peering and union, zivug, on the one hand, and connection, chibur, on the other, are two distinct phenomena. 
We speak of connection, chibur, when two lights shine towards each other from their respective places without drawing closer to one another. And for this reason, the further the light is from its source, the weaker it comes. The sages call this separation, although there's no actual separation between the lights. It's just that when they are not close to each other, it's called separation. And this is the idea of uprooting the plants. Now here we're dealing with a very uh, difficult concepts to understand. The two concepts of zivug and chibur. Chibur, peri, uh, chibur uh, joining and zivug of uh, partnership and cooperation. In Hebrew the word chibur refers to multiplication. Five times four is twenty. If you have a courtyard that has a dimension of five yards length and four yards breadth, the total area is five times four, that is twenty. That is called in Hebrew chibur. Now, if we are going to say that these two elements, the five and the four, expressed mathematically in Hebrew as a He and a Dalit, He having the value of 5 and Dalit having the value of 4, we produce a Chibur by joining the He and the Dalit and uh, these two could be two dimensions of a particular space that we could draw in a diagram represented by one side having the length of five units and the other side having the length of four units. So these two concepts, the concept of the five and the concept of the four, are joining together in this chibur in order to produce some out of metaphysical elements, some physical space. That's the first concept. On the other side, there is the concept of the zivug. Zivug is more than just two elements somehow connected with one another. Here, the two elements are actually doing something. They are in a partnership. They're not simply creating passive space, but they're actually uh, doing something. Well, let's not try to reach perfect understanding of this concept right now because I doubt if we'll so easily be able to do that. Let's continue with our text and not worry too much if we haven't understood everything. What he said here is that when one divine light is far from another light, this can cause a separation, pirud. Now, there's no actual separation between the lights because it's all God's unity. The only distance is the distance in our minds between one very exalted level of divinity that is barely revealed and another level that is much more revealed to us. We could take an example. If, uh, yes, we believe in God Almighty, we want to be connected with God Almighty, but all the time we think that God is very far away from us, way, way above, we can easily lead to the uh, conclusion, come to the conclusion that this world is actually separate from God Almighty. And uh, whereas when we talk about the concept of Zivug, then we're talking about interaction that brings a, great, a far greater revelation of God in our world. So this flaw that we mentioned where two lights are very distant is only possible in the lower realms and the floor itself or the lower realm is separated, somehow seems independent from God. This cannot reach the Godly level. So now, the two lights of the first two letters of the divine name, the light of Yud, which is called the light of Chokhmah, wisdom, and the light of He, which is called the light of Bina. These first two letters of the Tetragrammaton are always perfectly connected with the cusp of the Yud above them. What he's saying here, uh, all these three, 
the cusp of the Yud, alluding to Keter, the crown, the first of all of the ten Sfirot. The Yud itself alluding to Chochmah, wisdom, and the He alluding to Bino, they're all bound together with a strong, firm bond. But in the lower realms, we do find separation as a result of men's sins. The Yud separates from the He, the He from the Vav, and the Vav from the second He. In other words, what we're hearing is that on God's level, the source of the creation, namely Keter, the crown, God's will, and the wisdom through which he brings about the creation, the blueprint, and the understanding with which all of the individual parts become differentiated, each in their proper place. This is an interconnection of three elements, Keter, Chochmah and Bina, which are connected all the time. However, as the creation descends from this divine source into the material world as we know it, we are living in the world of separation. And when we are trying to grasp and attain these divine levels, we have to separate them out in our minds, and we are in this world of separation. Well now, this concept of chibul, where two lights which are far from one another join together, this is in contrast to the concept of zivug, hearing and union which occurs when the lights actually draw close to each other. In other words, God can certainly bring his light closer to us. He just uh, turns up the intensity of the revelation and uh, the higher light will shine down to the lower light and actually draw close. So when they join together in this way, who can express the beauty of their holiness and the power of their radiance? Like a raging fire, they flash passionately to each other. This is the Holy One, blessed be He, and His indwelling presence that are now interacting, flashing like lightning, becoming tightly bound together. And the resulting power and delight bring joy to all the lights, that the whole successors, successive revelation of divinity coming up and down this whole chain and because of this, a flow of abundant blessings comes forth from him and descends to every level. So this peering and union is absent in the lower realms. In other words, we don't experience this directly. There is a divine will up above to bring about effects in the world through the interaction of his various attributes but we don't actually see this. That's why our sages said that uh, the Holy One, blessed be He, said, I shall not enter the heavenly Jerusalem until I enter the earthly Jerusalem. That is to say, all the while that the earthly Jerusalem is incomplete in our time now of destruction, of concealment, of separation, then even God's temple above is also incomplete because God will not attain, uh, will not bring the completion of his creation in the upper worlds until our realm itself is rectified. But as the repair of the light brings the earthly Jerusalem to greater and greater perfection, uh, their power will spread and through the revelation of the higher lights in our world, the temple will be built around these lights in the lower world. But in the absence of this state of repair, in the absence of this state of tikkun, as a result of sin, the earthly house is destroyed. However, as we said earlier, the heavenly temple never ceased to exist. As we heard before, the heavenly temple was actually God's intended ultimate revelation that was already in place before the creation that was designed to lead to it. So the heavenly temple never ceased to exist. If it did, as we said, the entire universe would be destroyed in a moment. It's the heavenly temple as shining down blessing to our world. In other words, 
all of the wisdom of the Kabbalah and the writings of the Zohar and of the writings of Ari that speak about all of the levels of divine blessing in the higher worlds. They've been there all the time and Rabbi Moshe Chanutzada is calling them the temple. The whole universe is a, is a kind of temple and above on the spiritual level it's there all the while. It's just that its original brilliance has grown dim and it lacks the intense joy it radiated when it was the glorious residence and resting place of the king. However, as the creation becomes rectified, when the sinners are removed from the earth, things will return to the way they were at first. That is to say, on God's level of purity before the rupture that came into the world through sin, we will have a restoration and the light will be brighter, the flow of blessing will pour forth in abundance, and for this reason the temple will indeed be rebuilt in the lower world, and its glory will be greater than that of the first two temples, as we shall be discussing later on. Well, I hope that as we come into the meat of this work, as Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutata will begin to explain to us the various areas of the temple, he will give examples of how these two aspects of the chibur, the joining, and of the zivug, the pairing and the interaction, are expressed in the physical form of the temple. It's all a little abstract right now, but uh, with the help of God, we shall get to greater understanding as we proceed. I would like to refer people to the translation of Mishkine Elyon, which is available on azamra.org website under the section on Kabbalah and mysticism. And there is the complete translation of this work, and there's also an extensive overview discussing all of the main concepts in this work. So with that, we conclude today's discussion of the secrets of the future temple.